Would you stand with me? Let's read from the Gospel of Matthew together. Me, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be seen, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise Amen. God. You may be seated. Welcome, welcome. I'm Ben Unseth. I get to serve as the pastor here at Faith Lutheran Church and thrilled that if you're visiting with us this morning, we'd love to get a chance to say hi and tell you what, if you come back next Sunday, it won't be so cold. Pretty, pretty impressed that you came out this morning. So we are in the middle of a series looking at how God wants to break into our lives, how he, he shows up when we need him most, sometimes when we're not looking for him. And this morning, we're taking a look at Matthew 6, and there's great news that God is here to meet you. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he comes into our lives, and he invites us to respond to him. So looking at the passage this morning, we're going to talk about, well, Jesus talks about money, our words, our time. You could say that they add up to your lifetime, your eternal investment portfolio. I mean, it, I, I, not discounting any other investment portfolios because we, we have great folks here at church who can help you with those things. But there is something beyond this life, isn't there? There's, there's something that goes on forever. So we want to take a look at what Jesus has to tell us here. He says, Don't, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Does that mean you shouldn't have a bank account? I don't think so. But where... Where is the focus of your life? Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. That, that's his great advice for us. So how do we do that? that? That is a pretty big thing to think about. And this is actually well into a big teaching that Jesus is giving Jesus had seen the crowds, we read at the beginning of Matthew 5, a chapter earlier, and it says he went up on a mountainside and sat down, and his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. So this is in the middle of a quite a, a series of stories and examples he's giving them. And one thing that I almost want to skip over, but Jesus says it three times in here, so we probably should, should take a little look at it. He says, then my father will reward you. My father will reward you. My father will reward you. But I love the way William Barclay talks about this. He says, remember that the highest reward never comes to him who is seeking reward. If a man is seeking reward, he will miss it because he is looking at God and looking at life in the wrong way. The basic mistake of this point of view is that it thinks of life in terms of law instead of love. He who is in love is always in debt. The last thing that enters his mind is that he has earned a reward. But if a man has a legal view of life, he may think constantly in terms of reward that he has won. But if a man is looking at life through love, the idea of reward will never enter his mind. Reward is at one and the same time the byproduct and the ultimate end of the Christian life. So, 
Yesterday morning, I was here early with the men's group, and a fellow named Jay to told me about a fellow that went to heaven and you know, was at the pearly gates and hoping to get in, and he said an angel told the gentleman, well, you know, heaven functions on a point system. You have to get 100 points to come in. And the fellow said, oh my. Um, well, the angel said, you know, you, got to, you just got to come up with 100 points. Well, I've been married for 56 years, and I never faltered in my devotion to my wife. And the angel said, well, that's really, really good. You get three points. Oh my. Um, well, I, I used to serve at the soup kitchen sometimes. And the angel said, that's terrific. You get two points. <sighs> what else have you done? Um, I taught Sunday school for 10 years. Well, that's terrific. You get two points. And the man just <sighs> exclaimed, I'll never get in except for the grace of God. And the angel said, come on in. We can't turn our way, can we? We can't be good enough. We, but Jesus tells us, invites us in this passage to think about as we're walking with him, how, how can we come closer to God? How can we welcome God to expand his presence in our lives? It's a wonderful opportunity to think about. So the first thing he brings up is money which is what everybody wants to hear about when you come to church. When you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. And then he says the same phrase again. When you give to the needy, do not let your, let your right hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. He doesn't say if, he says when. There's a big difference there, isn't there? And generosity is part of how God created the universe. It's, God is a generous God, and if I'm not living generously, I am, I'm stealing the joy that God wants to put in my life. And sometimes we think about this in, with regard to the offering plate in church. And I, I invite you to participate in that, although we don't pass a plate, we've got that cool new wooden kiosk out there. But this is talking about giving directly to somebody in need, not about their gifts at the synagogue or our gifts at the church. This is saying that you are connected to somebody who needs help, or you will be connected to somebody who needs help and God will want to use me and you to bless somebody. And the, the Bible isn't joking when it says, blessed. it is more blessed to give than to receive. I remember one of my kids one time, I gave him five bucks to go in and buy something at the convenience store. And he came back and I asked him for the change. And he said, I was feeling generous. There was something on the counter, you know, to give to some charity. I was feeling generous, so I put it in. I said, generosity is when it's your money, not when it's my money. <laughs> but God puts people in our paths. I remember when I first moved to California years ago, it was... It was Christmas, and I was only working two jobs, and I didn't have quite enough money to live yet. It, that didn't come, come together until I got the third job, and I wasn't quite there yet. Life is great in California, don't you know? And it was Christmas Eve, so there in church with my kids, you know, went to, I don't know, like a five o'clock service or something, and went home, and was just broke as a joke, and went home in the evening and wondering, you know, what, what, could, what could we do, and... So actually took them back to church at 1030 because they had really liked it the first time. So we, we went back again. And at the end of the service, this young man came walking across the sanctuary and handed me a hundred bucks. It was like a thousand bucks to me. It, it was such an incredible blessing to me and my family. 
changed everything that Christmas. And I can still see his face just walking across. His, he said, my dad told me to give this to you. And he, I don't know, he may still remember what I was looking like in that moment. And you either, as we're talking like this, somebody may come to mind right now that, that you could help out. Or maybe somebody will come to mind this week that you, through something that, that you, know, you could do, can really lift that person up. And that's a way that God will touch your life. That's why we read from Proverbs 11 this morning. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. It's the way God works. He, he fills up the person who's already busy giving. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. That's what Proverbs tells us. So God works through our giving. He wants us to live generously. What else is in our portfolio? All the words we use. Jesus says, when you pray, not if you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. When you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. And then he says, this then is how you should pray. And you know what great example he gives us? Our Father, who art in heaven. That's a great way to start your day. Maybe this week, before you even get out of bed in the morning, just pray the Lord's Prayer. When you go to when you lie down at night, pray the Lord's Prayer if you, if you can't come up with your own words. But what Dodu and Emu said was exactly true. You don't need to do fancy prayers. You don't need to do demanding prayers. You just need to talk to God. Tell God what's been great today. Tell God what's been awful today. Tell God what, what the problem is that you just can't figure out how to get through. That's prayer. And God works that way. A few months ago, I called up an acquaintance with a difficult, potentially very uncomfortable question. It, it was kind of a hard call to make. And I prayed and prayed, and then I called. And later I found out that they had looked up the exact same topic on the internet before, the night before I called. God worked ahead of time to make the potentially very difficult conversation easy. I remember years ago when I was in Pakistan, I was reporting to this wonderful guy, but he and I didn't always see eye to eye, and sometimes we butted heads. And it was coming up to summertime, and I was going to, I was, had this idea about going to another city, and we were really disagreeing about this, and it was driving me crazy, and I was praying. And I, I was praying, you know, Lord, I, th I think this is how it should go. This, this is what we should do. And we had an appointment scheduled the next day. And I went in and sat down with him. And you know what he said? You know, I've been thinking about it. And I think this is what you should do. It was exactly what, what I'd been praying about. That God, God can turn somebody else's heart. He will guide you. Now, I would like to say that people always want to do things the way I, I think it ought to be done. It doesn't work quite that way. I'm often wrong, probably, about how it should be done. But God will hear your prayers. He will work in ways that are beyond what you're thinking. He will guide your path. Our giving, our words, our prayers, and our time... This next little section says, when you fast, 
Do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting. Fasting was normal in Jewish life. It was expected, very unlike today. And when we think of the word fasting, we often think of depriving ourselves of something. And there is that aspect to it. It's saying, God, you're first. You are the most important thing in life. I, I am going to not be a slave to every impulse that comes into my life. I was talking with an Orthodox priest once, and I was, he was explaining to me part of the rhythm of his weekly life. He said, in his church, everybody fasts almost. He says, Sunday mornings, nobody eats or drinks anything until they come to communion. And I thought, that's a pretty cool idea. Sunday mornings, it just the, the first thing that he tastes and his congregation tastes is the bread and communion and the cup. And so that, that's what I tend to do on communion Sundays. I just, I just wait. I, can say, I just remind myself, God, you're first. I'm second. It's not a bad rhythm. Now, he also fasts. He says, yeah, so he says a lot of us in the Orthodox Church, we fast every Wednesday. And I thought, wow, I, I haven't quite figured that one out. But what, what is going on with fasting? I didn't put food here, I put time. Because when you think about, about it, how much time do you spend in a day putting food together and eating, sitting down to eat? It's a fair amount of time. What if you gave that time to God? Time is a big thing in fasting. It's, it's saying I'm going to unplug from what I normally do in this, in this slice of time, and I, I'm going to focus on God instead. And it can involve food. Jerry Falwell started a university in the middle of Virginia called Liberty University, which has been in a little bit of negative news over the last couple of years, but it's it's an incredible Christian university. They, they have 95,000 students, if you could imagine. 15,000 on campus, 80,000 online around the world. And they started in the 70s. He and Elmer Towns started it. And in 1990, they were $100 million in debt. Can you imagine? $100 million in the hole and 19... 1996, it was not getting much better. They, they had paid off half of that. They were, they were down to $52, $52 million in debt. Isn't that wonderful? And the, their regional accreditation body told them, we're going to withdraw your accreditation because you, you just have such a debt load. We, we can't recommend students to come to you anymore because you're going to have to fold. You're going to go bankrupt. And so Falwell was wondering, what do I do? And he decided to fast. He went on a 40-day fast. D drinking, he said he drank a little V8 every few days, but 40, 40 days, and in 40 days, $27 million came in. And he, a couple months after the fast was done, he was thinking, Lord, what are we going to do? There's still $25 million. And, and he felt like he should do it again. And don't ask me how, he did another 40-day fast. He said the first one was easy, the second one was excruciating. And they paid off the debt in full, which is pretty remarkable. And then a few years later, back in 2003, they were looking at expanding, and right next to their campus was 113 acres and it was owned by Ericsson, a phone manufacturing company. They had a manufacturing plant there. And the, this one building was 880,000 square feet. That is 20 acres in one building. There was a hallway that was half a mile long. And they had quit using the building because they had shifted most of their business to China. So they wanted to unload the building. So Jerry Falwell and Liberty University offered them $2 million for the building. It was valued at $100 million. 
And they said, nope, we're not, we're not going to, you, you got to make a real offer. You increase your offer. And so Falwell told them, we'll, we'll make a better offer if you sell it at an absolute auction. If you put it on the auction block, highest bidder gets to take it, guaranteed. And they were so stuck, they did. They, they put it on the auction block, and they didn't, Liberty didn't really have any money, but they thought about it, and they prayed about it, and they bid $10.2 million, and they got it. The only problem was they didn't have the money. <laughs> so they borrowed to the hilt. They went to all their friends and, and borrowed all the money they could, and, and they, they were ready to write the check. And Jerry Falwell was on a business trip that week, and he bumped into the owner of Hobby Lobby. And the owner of Hobby Lobby, you, you know, they were talking about it, and the, that fellow said, let me buy it for you. And he just donated the money. And Liberty didn't have to borrow a penny. They didn't have to spend a penny. They just, they just got a 20-acre building just donated to them, ready to move into. Fasting is amazing. And, but a lot of fasting, one huge aspect, really is time. So that's one reason I'm just so thrilled that you came to church this morning. Because you woke up this morning, and you weren't certain the car would start. Hopefully it would. But you knew it was going to be cold outside. But we, we remind ourselves that there's something more important than my keeping my toes and my fingers cozy and warm. I need to go and show up with people and worship God because that's what God calls me to do. And that's what you did this morning. We, we unplugged from the rest of our schedule and we, we're reminding ourselves we're giving God this time. And that's a, an hour and that's wonderful, but larger chunks of time are great too. The last weekend there was a, a women's retreat, the weekend before a men's retreat, and at one of those those retreats, people unplug for three days. They just disconnect from everything else going on in life, and they say, God, this time belongs to you. And when we do that, when we, when we give God this time, when we fast, in a sense, they actually eat an awful lot, but there's, the time is dedicated to God. When we dedicate this time to God, God shows up. So one person was praying in, in the prayer chapel during the retreat for Via de Cristo early Saturday morning, about 5 a.m., and was praying for one of the people who had come for the first time with just an intense, intense personal problem, something they could not break free from, something that was just tearing up their life. And later on in the weekend, ended up talking with that person. And that person said, you know, funny thing happened. I woke up really early Saturday morning and I just felt such peace and freedom. And the person said, what time was that? Well, it was about 5 a.m. Saturday morning. The exact same time that this person had been praying for them in the prayer chapel. Because when we dedicate time to God, whether it's withholding food or withdrawing from other activities and saying, God, this time belongs to you, God will show up. This is an epiphany. This is God breaking into our lives. This is why Jesus says these things. He doesn't say if you give. He says when you give because God wants to bless you and you're cheating yourselves of blessing if you don't do it. And he says, when you pray, because if I'm not talking to God, I'm, I'm hold, holding God away from me, and I'm cheating myself of the blessings God wants to work in my life. And he says, when you fast, because if I'm not dedicating time to God, whether it's withholding food or withdrawing from my schedule and dedicating time to God in some other way, I'm missing out on the possibility of what God wants to pour into my life. And that's what Jesus is inviting us into. That's why I called it your investment portfolio. That, that 
that this will, God wants to pour out these blessings. He uses the word reward here. He wants to show up in unexpected ways. And where does it start? Well, in Matthew 6, 1, Jesus says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. And that word acts of righteousness, the Greek word dikaiosuno, it can mean showing your religion, acts of righteousness, doing what is right. And that word also shows up in Romans 3.22. In Romans 3.22, Jesus, Paul tells us, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. In, Je in Matthew 6, Jesus is talking about these things that he wants us to practice, but where does it begin? Paul says that this righteousness is a gift to all who believe in Jesus. We don't come into this righteousness by, by getting good enough. We come into this righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. And then he, he welcomes us to cultivate some beautiful things. And he says he'll show up in our lives as we do that. And you maybe need that righteousness this morning. Maybe you're wondering, God, I am just so out of whack. I can't imagine you showing up in my life. And Jesus came across the universe and was born in a stable so that he could meet you and me. And then he suffered and he died on a cross to reconcile you and me, to, to bring us back into perfect relationship with the Father, to provide forgiveness for us. And you wonder, well, is, so he got, died on a cross. Well, how does that do anything? But we know that it's true because on the third day, he rose again from the dead. I've been to a lot of funerals, but I haven't gotten to see anybody raised from the dead yet. But Jesus was raised from the dead Prove that he can do this in your life and my life. Let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you that you give this righteousness through faith in Jesus. And Lord, we ask you to, to show us how to follow you. Lord, it, don't let it be a burden. Don't let it be a heavy load. Just put somebody in our past that we can be kind to, that we can give to. Lord, stir us up to pray, and Lord, we look to you for the answers. We thank you for your promise to hear us, and we thank you for your power to answer. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.